This tank holds three men, Japanese size. You may have noticed in the past, by how often I use their clips, that I am a big fan of Wargaming's Inside the Hatch series. I think they go into wonderful detail about the combat vehicles they cover from a very important but often overlooked point of view, the point of view of the ones that crewed them. By looking into details such as upkeep, features of individual positions, and most importantly, how easily that the crew could leave a potentially burning tank once the thing had been hit. A couple of weeks ago, I was given the opportunity by the awesome people at the Indiana Military Museum in Vincennes, Indiana, to check out the inside of their Type 95 Hago tank. After noticing no inside the hatch videos had been dedicated to Japanese tanks, at least as far as I know, I decided I would try my hand at a sort of wannabe tank tour of this style, because Western sources on Japanese tanks are lacking to say the least. So this is what I found. But first, some backstory. In the early 30s, the Japanese army began experimenting with mechanized warfare and wanted to combine their infantry with their armored force. The only problem is the Type 89, the tank currently employed, could not keep up with trucks, which moved at about 25 miles an hour. So a new tank was needed. Tomi Ohara of the Army Technical Bureau proposed a tank of about 7 tons that could travel this speed, and a prototype was completed in 1934. The test went well, but the tank was too heavy and slow at 4.5 tons. This began somewhat of an infight between the infantry, who were afraid that bringing the weight down via reducing the armor would make the tank incapable of supporting them, and the cavalry, who wanted the speed. After some tests in Manchuria, though, the cavalry won out and the Type 95 was born. The example we will be looking at is a later production version. Also, like most history nerds, I'm super stiff and awkward in person, so please take this golden opportunity to make fun of me in the comments. Look at that. That's what's between you and the Almighty. The front slope is about 12 millimeters of armor, riveted onto a frame. There's not too much on the front slope itself. There's two access hatches where you can see the transmission and the housing for the drum brakes there and the linkages connecting it to the pedals. There's also two points here for headlights. You have the bow gunner's mount, and to the left there you have the uh, driver's hatch and vision ports. The whole thing kind of opens up and out, as you'll see later. That's not a real gun. The tank uses a bell crank suspension, where each of these bogies is on a bell crank connected to the hull, and they are then connected to this large spring that is behind this housing to which they kind of push on each other and pivot. Um, there's a couple advantages to this system. One, it's very simple to produce. And two, it's fairly easy to maintain. The downsides are that the, uh, the ride on this thing is very rough. I mean, you're talking about basically two bogies that are just pitching endlessly over whatever there is. One of the reasons they installed the asbestos padding on the inside was to help cushion the crew as they're knocked around and everything um, by going along on this very rough ride. One interesting thing to note is these bogies have a lot of play in them. I saw in a, an army reference film talking about how to take one of these things out and you see it go over a trench and the pitch of the bogies is just huge. Um, they actually say something like, make sure you dig your foxhole extra deep because these things will go quite a bit down into the ground. Sprocket wheel is at the front because the transmission is at the front, and then the idler wheel is there at the back. The track is tensioned from what I can tell by the use of this bolt here. I'm assuming you just take a big wrench and turn it either way to tension the track. I, I don't know nuts and bolts then. I don't care about it. The engine on this tank is 120 horsepower Mitsubishi six-cylinder air-cooled diesel engine. It had about a 16 horsepower to ton weight ratio and could pull the tank along at about 25 to 28 miles an hour. Also, with the configuration of the tank, the engine itself, which is missing on this particular vehicle, is tilted at kind of an angle so that it can properly uh, access and be connected to the crankshaft to send power to the transmission. You can also see the exhaust system with the muffler right here. The 
driver's compartment is dominated by the Type 94 37 millimeter uh, tank gun. It fired two types of projectiles, uh, high explosive and armor piercing, although I imagine armor piercing was preferred given its uh, design role. And there are racks for it everywhere. Um, this is a dummy round, but uh, there's just racks all throughout here, and I imagine loading and everything was not that much of a process. You can just take it with one hand, throw it in. The gun was controlled. Basically, it doesn't have any elevation gears or anything like that. Um, this one's frozen into place, but you would have kind of a shoulder mount that you would use. So as you're looking through the sight, which would be here-ish, um, you're holding the gun up, and then you would pull the trigger once you're on target. It, sort of as a basic form of stabilization, if you can think of it like that, but it's just the fact that this gun is not heavy enough to really warrant gears as long as it's balanced properly. There are about six of these little horizontal vision slits here and then four of these vertical ones. And one of the things that the Type 95 had going for it before a lot of tanks of its era is these oftentimes had uh, bulletproof glass over them with some rubber mounting around it, which was something that you don't see on World War II tanks typically till later on in the war. Everybody else at this point is using just straight vision slits. They've been removed from this tank, but from what I understand it was standard on most of them. Alright, so I'm now in the what's left of the driver's position. The steering was conducted by two tillers, pretty similar to all other tanks at the time. Um, I couldn't find any sources on exactly how this worked, um, what positions you needed the sticks in to do certain things, um, but I imagine it's pretty similar to other tanks of the time, T26, things like that. His control panel is right here. I imagine it was a speedometer, tachometer, and uh, either oil or fuel gauge. Um, not sure what these would have been. I'm sure I'll be linked a picture of one of these uh, dashboards as soon as the video goes up. His hatch has two, or I guess three modes of vision. There's vision slits right here. And then this centerpiece, in theory, comes out, but I don't think this one does. And then the entire hatch itself moves out like that for non-combat situations. And actually, for how thinly armored this is, it's actually a pretty heavy hatch. It kind of, it goes up and extends to the top, so the springs, or the hinges, are actually up here, and that's how you move it. I imagine this had something to do with uh, locking it in place, but that is also gone. So I'm now in the bow gunner's position. The machine gun used was the Type 97 heavy machine gun, which was a domestic version of the Czech ZB VZ-26 light machine gun. The weapon fired 7.7 millimeter cartridges and was fitted to the tank with a by 1.5 telescopic sight with a 30 degree field of view. This gun was used primarily in Japanese tanks as its weight prevented it from being used by the infantry. They preferred the Type 99. There'd be an exact same machine gun up in that um, port up in the commander's hatch in the rear. His seat would be right here, which was no longer there. And from what it looks like from the mounting points on the floor, it'd be fairly far up. So his head would probably automatically be about here. Um, and then he'd have a sight in which he would look out of. Um, an interesting thing about these guns, there's a point in the turret up there that's just a small mounting point that, from what I understand, part of the mount of the machine gun itself could be taken out here and the machine gun removed, and then that piece of the mount could go in that little hole in the top of the turret, and so you could then, instead of having a mounted machine gun in one of the ball mounts here, it could actually be mounted in a piece of the uh, turret for the commander to use as an all-around defense weapon. The ammunition for the machine gun would be kept in racks here, and I believe here from the source photographs I saw. It actually, I mean, I, I figure if you had a seat here, this would be fairly spacious. I'm not sure, uh, from everything I've seen, there's no covering over the transmission and things like that, so you'd have to be careful to not get your feet caught in there. The only thing I'm worried about is there's really not a good way to get out quickly. Um, the driver's hatch next to you would be, I guess, technically the closest thing, um, but he'd be pushing it out and have to get out first, and then the commander behind you would have to get out here. So either way, you're waiting for someone else to get out before you can get out, which um, in the few seconds between getting in and out when the tank is on fire or something like that, that could be, that could be important. 
Being the bow gunner was his only role. There were no radios in these tanks except for up to the regimental level and then higher. All commands from the regimental level to below were given via signal flags. That or I also read accounts of a lot of times the regimental commander would basically say follow my lead and they would go in and attack. There's also no mounting points for any internal radios. I'm guessing the commander is just yelling at everybody what to do, but this thing is so small. I'm guessing the commander could just crouch down and yell something and these guys would hear it. So I know a lot's made about the Japanese tanks not having radios, but this one especially with how small it is. I don't see it being as big of an issue as it has been, or as it would be in other tanks. I mentioned earlier the asbestos lining um, for the inside of the tank. This had two roles. One, it was meant as kind of a heat barricade, because in uh, Southern Pacific, things like that, in the sun, these walls got extremely hot and hot to the touch, and so it was kind of a lining against that. Um, also, I mentioned the really rough ride of the suspension earlier. They were also meant as a sort of crash mat, I guess, for lack of a better term. So when you're being thrown around in here, it's better to hit, I guess, a slightly softer asbestos uh, mat than just um, a steel plate. Um, but you'll see stuff sort of like this. Um, it's all been torn out, but you can see where the uh, the lining had been. One thing I forgot to mention in the driver's position is the shifting stick would be right here, and it's dead center between the two of them. I imagine a lot of the uh, bow gunner's job was also just assisting the driver, uh, maybe helping him shift and things like that. One interesting thing to note, this is the only uh, vision port cover that I could find that was still in here, but um, it's kind of neat. It actually has two parts. This, it's frozen into place, but this would move and actually cover the vision port itself. It does, though, however, have this little slit in it so you can still see out even if the vision port is closed. And then under a very dangerous scenario, you could then close that to where you're totally sealed up. Several variants of the Type 95 were produced, including a recovery vehicle, the Kami amphibious tank, and even an assault gun prototype. Also, many other Japanese tanks, such as the Type 97, were based off its layout and design. And it ended up being the most widely produced tank by Japan, with about 2,300 vehicles produced, seeing action wherever the Japanese army fought from 1935 to 1945. These tanks, though, from an American perspective, were not very good tanks and paled in comparison to the Sherman and even the Stuart to an extent. Because of this, Japanese tanks are seen as more or less of a joke by armor fans. But I think this is somewhat misplaced. Although Japan did not go on to upgrade and make heavier tanks like other combatants of World War II, at the time it was created, the Hago was a very capable vehicle compared to what other countries were making, such as the T-26 and Panzer I. We also forget that Japan's main enemy for most of their time in the war was China, a country with no significant tank force. So this tank suited them very well in that theater. But most of all, Japan is a naval power. And as a result, most resources were given to the Navy. Tank design and implementation was somewhat of an afterthought to the Japanese High Command. With these things in mind, the creation of small numbers of thinly armored and lightly armed tanks starts to make more sense, and at least somewhat justifies Japan's actions as far as it comes to tanks. Once again, thank you to the Indiana Military Museum for the access to this vehicle. Anyone who lives in the Midwest should make a point to visit this museum. They have a wonderful collection and have an amazing staff. I'll link all their information below that you should check out. I was always under the impression being from the Midwest that I'd have to travel pretty far to see a real tank museum. But this place is awesome and has a fantastic collection and I couldn't recommend it more. They were even nice enough to let me in and around their other tanks kept in storage. And I'll close the video with some shots of the other awesome pieces they have. Point of no return